Canadian football is a magic show, a century-old spectacle, grown men battling to cross a line drawn in the dirt. It is a game filled with heroes, great players and great teams, bringing championship pride to their faithful fans. The field is a battleground where skill and determination are the tools of the trade. It is a game that has grabbed the nation by the heart. An annual struggle becomes an epic battle as teams fight for the ultimate glory. The chance to hold the Grey Cup and become forever known as a champion. Canadian football was born in the mid-1800s, a child of rugby reshaped by robust young men off on a new world adventure. The version they devised, rougher, tougher, bloodier, found a home on university athletic fields where the student body became the game's first fans. But this wonderful new game was strictly a Canadian phenomenon until a fateful weekend in 1874 when the men of McGill University accepted an invitation to play two matches at Harvard and found the Americans playing a different game entirely, an offshoot of soccer containing little of the rough and tumble chaos now so dear to the Canadians' hearts. They played one game under the Canadian rules, under McGill's rules, one game under the uh, Harvard rules, in the end, Harvard enjoyed the type of football that McGill brought so much that they rode away to rugby school in England and they got the official rugby rules. The game of the North was now a cross-border phenomenon. Soon, it spilled over the campuses and into the cities, then west with the settlers. No longer merely the sport of the educated elite, it became the game of the working masses. Teams sprang out of meetings held in rooms over grocery stores, in mechanics halls and rowing clubs. Bankers bashed ironworkers. Lawyers took their lumps from lumberjacks. Leagues were born, collapsed, and rose again. A new country had a new game and new heroes. By the turn of the century, football had been embraced by athletes of all ages and from all walks of life, competing for trophies of every shape and size. In 1909, word of this new game caught the attention of Albert Henry George Gray, the fourth Earl Gray and the Governor General of Canada. Well-known patrons of Canadian arts, the Earl and his wife decided that the new game should have a true national championship. At a cost of $48, Lord Grey provided a simple silver trophy that would one day be the stuff of dreams, the Grey Cup. The cup was donated by uh, the Governor General, uh, Lord Earl Grey, who probably never saw a game played. Uh, he put up the trophy for the Amateur Football Championship of Canada, and people who were playing football in all parts of Canada saw it as emblematic of the national championship. The first Grey Cup game was held on a chilly December Saturday in 1909. 3,800 fans made the trek to Rosedale Field to watch the University of Toronto defeat the Parkdale Canoe Club in what was rather grandly called the Canadian Championship. But Lord Grey's trophy wasn't there. Someone had forgotten to have it engraved. The games then were simple gatherings young and not-so-young athletes out for a rough-and-tumble afternoon. 
But soon, Earl Grey's Cup was more than just another trophy. As the decades passed and the number of challengers grew, it would become the new game's Holy Grail. In the 1940s, not even a world in conflict could halt the yearly quest. When Canada went to war, enlisted men formed teams and battled for the cup under military banners. Through rain, fog, mud, or the chill of Canadian winter, the cup chase never faltered. Now, the pursuers wanted more than the championship. They wanted that magical, matchless moment when they could grasp Earl Grey's cup and triumphantly hold it high. When you win the Grey Cup, you know, you're, you're on such a high because you've accomplished what nine teams start out to do and only one does. What it meant to the city of Winnipeg and the fans, uh, that's when it starts sinking in uh, of just how important the Grey Cup is and what it means to the people of Canada. It really didn't hit you till a few days later and you, you know, when you get back in Edmonton and you're going to the parade and say, hey, this is kind of a big deal. The city of Vancouver, on our uh, return, just opened their arms to us. A marvelous thing and very special. There was love here for the BC Lions. 20 below weather, the streets were lined all the way from the airport entrance to City Hall, where they took us back to on buses, and the town just went nuts. Every team sets out, and you want to win the championship. Win the championship. That is a successful season. Anything else isn't successful. It didn't really hit me at the, after the game. It hit me the next year, seeing that this trophy is going to be forever. Your name's going to be a part of it, and you're going to be associated with a great cup winning team. Canadian football's eastern roots gave this rugged game at least a touch of refinement. Out west, settlers toughened by hardship and prairie winters reveled in their own bone-crushing version, fought with a ferocity and abandon that turned a simple game into a no-quarter battle. They just threw money into the pot, and the first one that drew blood uh, got the money. Uh, there were a lot of broken bones and uh, broken noses and front teeth missing and that kind of thing. In the uh, first game, Regina played against Saskatoon. Up in Saskatoon, the uh, police chief was so upset with the fact that the uh, Regina team was winning and he thought they were playing too rough against the Saskatoon boys that he came on the field and had the Regina team arrested. In spite of the potential for injury or arrest, football thrived on the Canadian prairie. The Hamilton Tigers became the first team to journey west, playing exhibition games in Winnipeg, Moose Jaw, Regina, and Calgary. While Eastern teams were happy to share the game with the West, sharing their championship trophy was another matter. Only Eastern teams were, would play for the Grey Cup. And in 1911, the Calgary Tigers won the, the championship of the West, and they challenged. They wanted to play in the Grey Cup. And the CRU wouldn't let them. They, they would turn them down. They said, if you didn't play in the East, you, you can't play challenge for the Grey Cup. Finally, with great reluctance, the Edmonton Eskimos were allowed to come east in 1921 to challenge Toronto for the right to sip from the Earl's silvered mug. Their timing couldn't have been worse. They ran head-on to the man known as the big train, Lionel Conacher. They ended up losing 23 to nothing in that game. Conacher, as a matter of fact, uh, scored 15 points and uh, halfway through the third quarter had to leave because he had a hockey game that night. Hockey and football were just two of the many sports on the Conacher resume. All played so brilliantly that he was named Canada's athlete of the half century. Since 1921, Western teams had marched east for the Grey Cup game, only to fall to the Eastern football powerhouses. In desperation, they cast their eyes not to the heavens, but to the south. 
we didn't have the population in the West that uh, they had in the East, so in order to get enough guys, uh, you know, it was, uh, we had to supplement them with uh, good, uh, experienced American players from American colleges. And, uh, of course, the first su most successful of those teams was the Winnipeg team in 1935. Winnipeg coach Joe Ryan took a fishing trip to Minnesota and North Dakota that fateful summer of 1935. His bait, money, and he landed his limit. For $7,400, he came home with nine imports, including the West's first superstar, the incomparable Fritzy Hansen. With Fritzy carrying the mail, the Bombers romped through the West and into the Grey Cup game, where, on a muddy field in Hamilton, stunned Easterners got their first look at the little big man from Minnesota. Fritzy Hansen was an import that, for Winnipeg, and he was one of these scatbacks that could dangle, and he caught a couple of kicks and ran right through the whole team because nobody had any traction. He had the whole field to himself, and he made the game look easy for Winnipeg, and he made a great name for himself. In Fritzy and Friends, the Canadian Rugby Union did not see players of great skill. They saw a threat to the very game itself, with teams buying championships and Americans shoving local boys off the roster. Their solution changed the rules. The CRU decided that uh, they didn't want these American imports coming in uh, specifically to win a competition. So they passed what was called a, a one-year residency rule. And they said that any American playing in the Grey Cup game had to be in the country for at least one year prior to the game. American imports were now a fact of Canadian football life. Although their numbers increased with the years, they did not destroy the game as the CRU had so darkly predicted. They enhanced it. The Northern League thrived, an alliance that continues to bring great American players to a game that remains distinctly Canadian. There's something about the Canadian Football League in Canada. It's got a tremendous uh, history about it when you go back and look at some of the great people that have come up here and lived in this country and they got the opportunity to play. I mean, this is what the game's all about. It was an opportunity that I was being given that I didn't see happening in my own country. And I really weighed the pros and cons of going to Canada or staying in the United States. And I chose to go to Canada because they were giving me a realistic opportunity to play the game that I love. I wanted to come play. And in the NFL, they would have just used me for, you know, okay for this and for that. And in Edmonton, I knew I had a chance to do what I wanted to do and play the game. It put the fun back in football for me. It enabled me to go back out, just be an athlete, play football and enjoy it. And I'll be forever grateful for that. During the Depression, there was seldom a penny to spare for children's games. But kids who longed to play football could always find a way. Nobody had a football, so we'd take somebody's cap, you know the old caps that the kids used to wear, you'll see them in pictures, and stuff it with uh, padding, and we, so we have no kicking game, so it's a running game only. And uh, that's how we got started. All our footballs were homemade. We couldn't afford a football. Well, I had some made like a football, made out of a sack or some stuff, sack or a pig's bladder or something like that. But the only time that I ever touched a real football is when I went to uh, high school. But young boys become young men, and there are real footballs to be thrown and real games to be played. As a pastime becomes a passion, a game becomes a way of life. Though the stakes grow higher and the wins more important, it all comes down to a simple love of the game. Canadian football was plain, old-fashioned mayhem. You played it, in my day, you played it because you loved the game. The players didn't make any money, they, uh, and so they all held jobs. Stukas worked for the star. And uh, as a football writer, while well, at the time he was playing, which he certainly gave himself the benefit of the doubt in his stories, 
Stukas tells the story of playing for the Argonauts when they won the Grey Cup, I think it was 1938, and uh, all he got for it was a windbreaker. Uh, he says a really nice windbreaker. Though the players weren't making any money, they could see by the crowds paying their way into the parks that someone was. They decided it was time they got a piece of the pie. The man the Toronto Argonauts picked to plead their case, Annis Stukas. Management was quick to respond. How dare this goddamn football player ask for money? We let them play. We give them great uniforms. We go to the best hotels when we go out of towns. Holy mackerel, and now the guy wants money? Playing football in Canada was an uncertain profession at best, but the harsh Canadian winter was a virtual guarantee. Uh, I used to die in the cold. Uh, because you have the lighter uniforms on, so every time you hit the ground, you took a chunk out of your hide. It, you literally did take a chunk out of your body. And the, the, the most painful thing I had to do that day was take a shower. It was so painful to, to get in that water. In our first game, the referee had to stand under the goalpost. It was snowing so hard to see if the ball was going through on field goals and extra points. And I said, what did I get myself into here? I'm cold. Football was a daylight game. If dusk fell before the final gun, finishing the contest required a little help from the crowd. Fans were urged to park their cars along the sidelines because if the game got going too long, then uh, what would happen was that they'd turn the lights on and from their cars and, uh, and, and play it out that particular way. We were playing a game in Ottawa, and we played the last 10 minutes of that game, or five minutes of that game, uh, under headlights. They, they got the people to turn their headlights on in the cars, and that's how we finished the game. By the 1930s, football had been in Canada for better than a half century, and still the game looked a lot like rugby. The forward pass had found its way into the rule book, but not everyone cared or dared to use it. The kicking was the essence of the game. What the guys did is that they punted the ball and then ran down underneath it. As the forward pass came in in 19 around 1930, there were different rules. For example, if a pass was incomplete, it was a fumble. And so uh, it was used very judiciously. The man who changed all that was Warren Stevens. In 1931, he threw the Grey Cup's first touchdown pass in Montreal's 22-0 win over Regina. But change requires time. While the forward pass could be a quick and devastating weapon when successful, throwing the ball was still no simple matter. To be honest with you, we, we didn't throw that many passes as, as they do today. The, the darn balls, they were almost like, almost like a soccer ball. It was very difficult to, to grab a hold of the darn thing, so you just you laid it on the palm of your hand and threw it. In other words, you didn't grip it. Well, the ball we used was relatively primitive because it wasn't dimpled to enable the quarterback to grasp it easier. And when I look at it, I, you know, I can't believe the, the size and the shape compared to how it is today. Pass, run, or kick, the name of the game was hitting, and the padding offered little protection. The equipment I used, uh, people would laugh at. What you got when you went up with the big team was secondhand furniture. The training camp, the, the new guys coming in took old-timers equipment from a year or two years past. And if the shoes were a size too big, tough luck, wear them. The post-war years were a boom time for Canadian football. In 1948, 
the Calgary Stampeders galloped through the three-team West as they recorded the only undefeated season in league history. Heading east, the four-day train trip became a traveling party as the Stampeders made the cross-country trek to the Grey Cup game. Arriving with Stetson-topped fans, Indian chiefs, chuck wagons, and horses, the Stampeders didn't just come from the West, they brought the West with them. The 1948 Grey Cup game was pivotal in uh, turning a celebration into a national festival. The Calgary Stampeders brought their chuck wagons, loaded them on the train, uh, they had flapjack breakfasts, they had horses parading through hotel lobbies. It gave it another dimension and uh, from that time on I think almost every Grey Cup game has been measured by what happened in 1948. The Stampeders did more than defeat the Ottawa Rough Riders 12-7. Their victory and their fans' western exuberance turned a three-hour showdown into a week-long hoedown, and the party has never stopped. Grey Cup Day has become Grey Cup Week, a game once of regional interest is now a national obsession. And so, the story of the modern-day CFL begins. It is the story of a league often battered but never down of a game that is an important thread in the Canadian cultural fabric, a game that is ours and ours alone. Canadian football is, is something I was brought up on. I love the game because it's quick. It, it has always allowed the quarterback to be able to run with the ball. And I thoroughly enjoyed that challenge. The excitement in the game, in a Canadian football game, with the three downs, with the wider field, with the kick return, it may be the best game in the world to watch on television. It's so fast, it's so wide open, and it, I, I think it, it speaks to my personality. It's sort of a living on the edge type of football game. It's exciting. You're never out of a ball game in the Canadian Football League. And as a quarterback, that's all you want is a chance. You want to have the ball in your hands with one minute to play and give your team a chance to win the ball game. The Canadian Football League is arguably the most significant cultural institution in the country as it relates to bringing cities across the country together. It's the one thing, the one professional sport that we have left that we can say is purely Canadian. It's the only one. Canadian football is a magic show, a century-old spectacle, grown men battling to cross a line drawn in the dirt. It is a game filled with heroes, great players and great teams, bringing championship pride to their faithful fans. The field is a battleground where skill and determination are the tools of the trade. It is a game that has grabbed the nation by the heart an annual struggle becomes an epic battle as teams fight for the ultimate glory. The chance to hold the Grey Cup and become forever known as a champion.
football has been a part of Calgary life for more than a century. Long before they turned the Grey Cup game into a national celebration, Calgary's football fans cheered for the Tigers, the 50th Battalion, and the Altomas. In 1938, the Calgary Bronx were the most powerful team in the West. During the Second World War, football was on hold. But in 1945, the game returned to Calgary when the Stampeders first took to the field. Three years later, playing coach Les Lear signed a local Chinese-Canadian running back, Normie Kwong. I had just uh, finished a junior uh, campaign in which I was the most valuable player for, the, for my team, so I thought I had a fair shot at it. I always felt I could hold my own on the field, and uh, I always really wanted to play. I was so young that I, I, I guess I was too, too dumb to be intimidated. After recording the only undefeated season in league history, the 1948 Stampeders captured the West. Heading to Toronto for the Grey Cup game, coach Les Lear made certain that the team remained in top shape. We went down on the train, and uh, Les Lear was such a stickler on conditioning that every time there was a stop, the players had to go out and run around the train. And if there was a half hour stop, we used to have to get out, put on our sweats, and run around the train. I don't think Toronto had ever seen anything like the Calgary Stampeders coming east. Uh, they brought their chuck wagons. They had horses parading through hotel lobbies. It gave it another dimension. Facing the Ottawa Rough Riders, the Stampeders ran the ball effectively, but it was their trademark aerial attack led by star quarterback Keith Spaeth and receivers Woody Strode and Normie Hill that made the difference in their 12-7 victory. With their first Grey Cup in franchise history, the Stampeders and their fans celebrated all the way home. The train ride back was a continuous four-day party. It went on from day and night. There was one, uh, one of the cars was a empty, just a freight car, I guess, and they used it. The band used to play in there. They had a Western band, and people would be dancing. And Every time we stopped on the train, there were fans out, even in the middle of the night, to uh, greet the team because they knew the, the team was coming through at that point. As the Stampeders celebrated, Les Lear and Woody Strode made a trip to Hollywood to visit Strode's former teammate and now actor, Ezra Sugarfoot Anderson. I was working in the picture with Paul Douglas and uh, Linda Donnell. Everybody does it. And here this uh, doors open to the studio and this big tall black guy walks in with a short white guy and I says, who in the heck is this? Lear and Strode convinced Sugarfoot to resume his football career in Canada. Before he left, his mother decided to do a little research. She says, I can't find anything on Canada in the library, but uh, it's a lot of Indians and uh, Royal Mounted Police, and that's it. She kind of feared that I was going into rough territory. The defending champion Stampeders returned to the Grey Cup in 1949, but this time they were outgunned. Flinging Frankie Filchuk and the Montreal Alouettes captured a 28-15 victory, but the loss did little to dampen the spirits of the Calgary contingent. We rode that train coming back from the Grey Cup, but I loved it. We had a bar car, we had a dance car, and we just had a ball coming back on the train. For the Stampeders, the 50s began with a huge mistake. They decided they could do without Normie Kwan. I had been out for about a month and uh, was an ankle that wouldn't go down, wouldn't, wouldn't, didn't seem to want to heal. And my father took me to Chinatown into one of the back rooms in one of the stores. And the fellow there wanted to give me a shot of whiskey and uh, put this poultice on my ankle, which he did. And I was playing the next week. But uh, I think uh, Calgary was a little suspicious, and I believe there was a doctor. I heard later on that there was a doctor that told him that I would never play again. And so they were quite happy to trade me to Edmonton. In 1960, the Stampeders signed Lavelle Coleman, a back who brought both power and speed to the Calgary offense. A year later, 
they had his equivalent on defense, a soft-spoken, hard-hitting linebacker, Wayne Thumper Harris. I knew I could play pro when I come out of college. It's just a matter of where it would be going. And I didn't know at that time where I'd be going. I was drafted by Boston Patriots. But when I came out of college, I was only 185 pounds. And uh, no one at that time were looking at 185 pound linebackers. Wayne Harris from the Calgary Stampeders was without question, to me, the most difficult guy to block in football. Uh, Wayne was not that big. He was extremely quick, and he would never, ever let an offensive lineman get a full piece on him. Wayne Harris certainly was the best football player that I think the Stampeders have ever had. Uh, I say that without reservation, but I can go one step further. Of all my years, I think I played and coached 39 years, and managed and so forth all those times. Uh, and he's the best football player I've ever been associated with. During the 60s, Calgary's McMahon Stadium was home to another great warrior, tackle Don Luzzi. When I first came to Calgary, he played both offense and defense. There was no such thing as uh, coming off after you played defense uh, for two plays and then coming on the sideline. You were in from the time the whistle blew at the beginning of the ball game to the time the whistle blew at the end of the ball game. In 1968, Calgary returned to the Grey Cup for the first time in 19 years. The Stampeders boasted a dangerous aerial attack led by quarterback Peter Lisk and Canadian receiver Terry Evanshin. But that day, they ran into another great passer, Ottawa's Russ Jackson. Russ Jackson was his, at his best as, as a quarterback. So it's something that I look back on and say, hey, I was there, but still didn't get my ring. So as I said, all I'm doing is suggesting that size 14 finger, any of the players that have more than one great, great cup ring, and they decide they want to donate to somebody, I'd wear it with honor. Two years later, in a sub-zero blizzard at Saskatchewan's Taylor Field, the Stampeders faced the Rough Riders in the deciding game of the Western Final. Trailing by two points in the dying seconds of the game, Stampeder coach Jim Duncan turned to place kicker Larry Robinson. Duncan came over and said, uh, okay, go kick it. And I thought to myself, why me? It was the worst weather I've ever played in in my life. Even uh, as a kid, I wouldn't go outside. I don't think it was so cold. And the snow was just going straight. The wind was 40 mile an hour against us. They are going into a wind that it is unbelievable there. I, I think they were only on about the 28 yard line or something like that. But anyway, I didn't even think they would try the kick because I didn't think anybody in the world could make a field goal from there. I hit the ball real well and it was going, going, going. And I thought I aimed too wide because uh, I, I thought I was gonna miss it because it was still way outside the post. All of a sudden, uh, I, there must have been an extra gust of wind or something. It just died and did a left turn fell over the goalpost and uh, I don't believe it to this day that it went you know that it went through but it did. Robinson's heroics took the third place Stampeders to Toronto for the 1970 Grey Cup against Montreal. Poorly laid sod left the field in ruins as the Stampeders fell to the Alouettes 23-10. Calgary returned to the final the following year on a rain-soaked field in Vancouver's Empire Stadium the Western champion Stampeders battled the Toronto Argonauts. Late in the game, the Stampeders were leading by three when an interception put the Argos in scoring position. I sent in a play. I said, uh, uh, we'll run a sweep to the left, and if it uh, opens up, take it. And, uh, but uh, if it doesn't open up, make sure you get in front of the goalpost because if the worst comes to the worst, we'll tie them and, and beat them with our kicking game. The slippery turf caused Toronto running back Leon McQuay to lose his footing and the football. The Stampeders recovered and held on for the victory. Even if McQuay had kept the ball, all they could have done was tied. And you got to remember, our defense dominated that game. They only made two first downs the second half. They only scored one touchdown in the game, and that was on a fumble. I'm disappointed at times that people realize that it's McQuay fumble that caused us to win. Our football team caused us to win. Any football player who starts out in the first of the season, that's her ultimate challenge is to win a championship. 
that was a veteran team, and a lot of guys have been waiting for a lot of years to win a game like that. But it was a great victory for us. We'd been there twice before and lost, and it's not a very nice feeling. Uh, so when we won it, it was just, uh, it was bedlam, it was crazy. Everybody just went wild. And uh, you, you say, finally, to win one, it was, uh, I was on a high for three weeks, I think, before I came down. Through the 70s, the Stampeders saw little team success, but Calgary fans retreated to highlight real performances from running back Willie Burden, the league's most outstanding player for 1975, and defensive all-star John Helton, who was twice named the game's top defensive player. John Helton could stuff the run, he could rush the passer on a screenplay, and still run downfield and keep it for like a two-yard gain. He was an amazing athlete at defense. I don't think there's many defensive tackles nowadays that had all those skills. John Helton was a clean, hard-nosed football player that when that game was on, did everything he could to win. But John Helton was also a guy that when the game was over, would come up, congratulate you, want to know if you'd want to go fishing. When the ball was in the air, the Stampeders relied on a Canadian receiver who was the third member of his family to wear Calgary colors, hometown hero Tom Forzani. Well, Tom Forzani, is, uh, he, he was, uh, he's a tough guy, mentally tough and everything like that, so uh, he could get open and catch the ball in, in any kind of condition. What I would try to do, and I, I think I did a pretty good job of it, would, I would eliminate the other players on the other team by the concentration on the football and the football only. Because if your ever mind ever wandered, then uh, your opportunity or your chances of catching that football greatly decreased. For the Stampeders, playoff appearances were rare and the Grey Cup a distant dream. But for Calgary fans, any season could be rescued by winning two games. The gang wars with the Edmonton Eskimos, known simply as the Battle of Alberta. The Battle of Alberta, you know, if, if you go back through history, you could have uh, the Eskimos uh, you know, winning Grey Cups in Calgary at the very bottom of the league, but uh, Labor Day, all bets are off. It's just a different game than any other game in Canadian football. The Battle of Alberta is uh, in all sports between Edmonton and Calgary. Uh, hockey, football, baseball, anything that goes on. And we hated them uh, worse than anybody. But uh, in the 60s, we were lucky enough that we beat the crap out of them most of the time. And there's no question that there was just a little bit more nerves and just a little bit more sincerity. It was serious, get down, dirty, hard-nosed fight. I always remember going down there on Labor Day and playing against them. and. Uh, being in the hotel the night before the game and their, their crowd would be outside of our hotel trying to keep us up all night, ranting and raving and screaming in, in the night. And anything they could do to disrupt us, it was, it was a tremendous rivalry. Edmonton and Calgary, whole, they hated each other. I didn't know two cities that close could really hate each other that much. Like if I went to, if I went to Calgary and I wore some Edmonton Eskimo stuff, God, people swear at me, cursed at me, it was terrible. Through the 80s, the Eskimos dominated the Stampeders. In 1990, Wally Buono took over as head coach, his top priority winning the Battle of Alberta. They had been, I guess, uh, so much in the shadows of the Eskimos uh, that they didn't believe that they, they could ever be better than the Eskimos. And I think because of that, uh, there was always that, you know, inferiority. That was something that, uh, you know, we felt or I felt that had to change. That year, Buono took the Stampeders to the top of the West, and the following season, they defeated the Eskimos to earn their first Grey Cup trip in 20 years. The game would be a learning experience for the Stampeders as they fell to the powerful Toronto Argonauts 36-21. The following season, the Stampeders signed a superstar, quarterback Doug Flutie. When we got Doug Flutie to come in with what we felt to be already a very good football club, uh, you know, we, we knew uh, going into training camp uh, that we were going to be a great cup champion and Doug had never won uh, a national championship so he was hungry too. 
Among an outstanding group of receivers, Flutie found a favorite, the incomparable Alan Pitts. He was the most dominant receiver I've ever played with. He could dominate a game. When he was getting going good and you were leaning on him to throw the ball and we needed big plays, he had the ability to put a move on a guy and break away and he put the ball up there and let him go make a play. In the 1992 Grey Cup game, Flutie and the Stampeders took to the field to face the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. Flutie wasted no time as he launched an immediate aerial assault. We put on an exhibition throwing the football against Winnipeg in that, that Grey Cup and it was just enjoyable. It really felt like we could do anything we wanted. The Stampeders scored on four of their first five offensive drives as they cruised to a 24-10 victory that made Doug Flutie a Grey Cup champion. It was my first championship, and uh, people in the States asked me you know, what the highlight of my career has been so far and all that, and yeah, some of the things that happened in college and the Heisman Trophy and all, but, um, and I've had a lot of great memories in the NFL now, but that was my first championship. And, and that 92 championship meant a lot to me. After two Western final defeats and a 1995 Grey Cup loss to Baltimore, it was the end of an era in Calgary as Doug Flutie left for Toronto. In 1998, Calgary was back in the championship against the Hamilton Tiger Cats. At the helm for the Stampeders, Jeff Garcia. Leading the Hamilton attack, quarterback Danny McManus. It was a classic Grey Cup battle. On their final drive, Calgary trailed by a single point. Jeff Garcia set the stage for a dramatic finish. Calgary just drove the ball all the way down the field. It looked um, with ease. Uh, Jeff Garcia was just unstoppable in that drive, throwing, running, doing whatever he wanted to, and then setting up Mark McLaughlin for a field goal that, you know, was going to go through. I felt pretty comfortable that, that Mark was going to step in there and make it, and, uh, you know, everything's happened so quickly that uh, when the ball went up, I saw the rotation, I knew he was going to have it, I, uh, and I put my hands in the air looking, looking for someone to jump on. Mark had already been, was running to the sideline uh, to, uh, to celebrate. You always want to win a championship, and it doesn't matter what level you're at, whether you're in junior high or, or playing in professional football. You're, you're, you're building and working for, for a championship, and by being in the league three years at that point, I, I realized how tough it was to get there, let alone win one, and you don't necessarily have a lot of players that win championships, and, and I've got my ring, and I'm, I'm happy to wear it. It was Dave Dickinson at the controls in the 1999 rematch with Hamilton. But Double D was not operating at full throttle. I was actually playing with, uh, with a broken bone in my left shoulder, and also I was dislocating in the left shoulder. So I was having a tough time uh, functioning out there, but I wasn't going to miss it. And, and it, it could be a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to start and play in that great cup. I wanted to give it everything I had. Dickinson performed well, but the Stamps had no answer for Hamilton's McManus to Flutie combination, and Calgary fell 32-21. In 2001, Calgary had another new face at quarterback, Marcus Crandall. Although the Stampeders were blessed with talent, they struggled to find their form. The first half of the season was not very much fun and uh, was not very successful. And, uh, you know, the second half, things started to, uh, you know, fall into place. And I guess there was a point in time, uh, you know, where the veterans got together and they took ownership of the football club and they sacrificed their own individualism to become a football team. And we were not a football team prior to that. A strong finish carried Calgary through the playoffs and on to the Grey Cup at Montreal's Olympic Stadium, where they faced the highly favored Winnipeg Blue Bombers. We felt uh, that we matched up well against them. I, I think the coaches, uh, you know, uh, got the players to believe that we could do the things we needed to do to, to win. Were we the best skilled team? Probably not, okay? We, 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 you know, we were focused at that time. We wanted to win, and uh, we had enough good players that we could win. In an MVP performance, Calgary quarterback Marcus Crandall threw two touchdown passes to lead the Stampeders to a 27-19 upset victory over Winnipeg. 
and Calgary celebrated its second Grey Cup championship in four years. That was a tough year, but uh, we gelled together as a team at the end, and, uh, and we achieved our goal. And that's just the best. That's the best feeling in the world to be a champion, and um, to say you're the champion of of the um, CFL for that year. No one can take that from you. So it's a great feeling, and um, and uh, nobody want to be number two. They always want to be number one. The Calgary Stampeders 2001 Grey Cup celebration continued a tradition born in 1948, when a train trip east turned a simple game of football into a nationwide obsession. Calgary is uh, the place that really got the Canadian Football League well established back in the Grey Cup of 1948 when they went down to Toronto and really put on a performance. And to this day, that tradition lives. Uh, it's a big entertaining event that brings Canada together and to make it, you know, the people proud to be Canadians and proud to support the Canadian Football League. I got the name Sugarfoot because of, first thing, size 15 shoe. My feet were size 15. And we, we were drinking in a bar. One night I had a good day. I caught about, I think, about 15 passes or something, made three touchdowns. And they say, you offer sweet today sugar and it just started from that they put it together sugar feet they said no i don't sound right say so sugar foot and and it started right there from there bunch of teammates round drink and it's been going ever since and if somebody calls me Ezra today i won't look around until it hits me that somebody knows my first name but sugar, Sugarfoot, I'll stop. We used to put on a clinic before the game started, Wood and myself. We'd get a quarterback, key space to throw us ball. And I used to catch balls with one finger, one hand. I, I just loved it. I was a natural athlete. And I just loved playing and, la and letting people see me play. I loved the game so. I would have played for nothing, really. I'm here hollering about the money, but I would have played football for nothing as long as I had people up there watching it and they enjoyed seeing me play. That's how I love the game. Decision that I made to stay in Calgary, peace of mind. Peace of mind. And the people treated me so, it, it was so nice. You could, you could walk the street and people stop you. Hi, Sugar, how you doing, boy? Nice game yesterday. You don't get that in L.A. Just like I said, we in a bar, and my good friend Joe Lewis was at the end. He just won the championship, and he's at the end of the bar, and somebody said, there's the champ down there. They don't even pay him any attention. They just keep drinking. But here, oh, how you doing, Sugar? You Okay. Everybody treating you fine, patting you on your back. Beautiful. Beautiful in the country. I just loved it. Fishing and hunting, I, I like that. And nobody bothers you. And today they don't bother me. We started with nine rookies, and I guess uh, Roy Shivers and myself 
sat down and uh, you know we you know kind of kindly said hey uh, you know why don't we just do it our way start fresh and uh, you know if it works great if it doesn't work at least we you know we gave it uh, our best and did what we want to do and uh, the thing about Alan Pitts was uh, we were working out a whole bunch of quarterbacks I think in April and Roy had gone to a camp and Alan was there and uh, he said well I got this receiver I want you to look at uh, you know, uh, why don't you fly him into Calgary and when you have your quarterbacks come in, he'll work out for you. I said, okay, that's no problem. So, you know, we flew Allen in and, you know, nobody knew who Allen Pitts was at that time. And, uh, you know, Allen wasn't uh, very athletic, wasn't very fast, but he was big. And, uh, you know, our team was so slow the year before as far as receivers that even a guy who ran 4'8 or 4'7'8 looked okay. You know, so I can remember Alan and myself uh, walking across McMahon Stadium, and Alan said, hey, coach, all I want to do is just play. He said, you know, give me whatever contract you want. It's got nothing to do with money, and, uh, you know, I think we gave Alan a $50,000 contract. And at that time, it was just, you sign players, that's what you sign them for. And uh, he went back home to L.A., got himself in, I guess, decent shape, because when he came back, uh, you know, he ran better than 4'8", and uh, we had him out as a wide receiver, uh, you know, and he, I think he caught 65 passes that year. The following year, uh, John Huffnagel, you know, uh, uh, we moved him to an inside receiver, and I guess uh, the rest is history, right? Edmonton and Calgary, whole, they hated each other. I didn't know two cities that close could really hate each other that much. Like if I went to if I went to Calgary and I wore some Edmonton Eskimo stuff, God, people swear at me, cursed at me. It was terrible, but I got them back good though, cause for the 1993 Grey Cup, me and Willie Pless, we bought 500 stickers, Edmonton Eskimo stickers, and everything we see Calgary Stampede on, we stuck a sticker on it. So it was 500 Edmonton Eskimo stickers sticking on something down there. That was a big rob. I didn't know people hated me there. This one old I never forget. This one old lady used to sit behind the bench. She had to be about 80 years old. And I go, now I, I was warming up on the sideline. She stood up with her cane. I thought she was joking at first. She said, don't you be running touchdowns on this football field. She pointed at me with her cane. I said, oh, I said, oh, grandma. She said, don't you grandma me, because if you do that again and run a touchdown, I'm going to hit you with this damn cane. I'm like, she taking it serious. Oh, she was like, really, you know, didn't want me to be. She go, you always taking the game away from us. And like, oh, I'm like, wow. This made it interesting, <laughs> but it was it was it was a big rival. I, I never could figure out why a city, you know, those two cities could hate each other so much. We brought the cup home, and to me, it was a championship. I was just so relieved to win it all, and I had that American point of view of. Uh, I didn't know a lot about the tradition of bringing the cup home and taking it around the city and all that, and Sponge introduced me in a hurry. Dave Sponge, uh, we had the cup over at Nick's right across the street, the restaurant that a lot of the players hung out at, and uh, that night we did a live sports show at 11, and I remember Sponge going in with a ski mask on into the studio, kind of hijacking the sports show that night, and you know, dragging me along with them and bringing the cup on the air and telling the people of Calgary, yeah, we're taking it down to, um, we're taking it downtown tonight. We're going to be out on the strip in the bars or whatever. And, and Dave took it around all night long. And just the whole atmosphere for him was just, it, it introduced me to, to what it meant to a city to win the Grey Cup. Someone asked me a question one time about whether I like playing offense or defense. Uh, I like both because in, in those days, the, the manner with which we had to block was totally different than they are today. And, uh, and when you feel, and when you block someone, you felt like it was a great accomplishment. Playing defense is different. It was uh, the idea of, you know, beating and outmaneuvering the man in front of you or or the men in front of you, whether it be a single or a double team. And that, that was a great accomplishment. Getting to the quarterback was super. 
was the I, the ultimate. And, and you know, being down, uh, laying on the quarterback while he was trying to breathe, and you were pretending trying to get up, and, and making it more difficult for him to, to catch his breath. That was the ultimate. Well, Calvin Anderson, you know, is, uh, you know, when you think of a guy bringing his lunch pail to work, that's Calvin Anderson. Uh, you know, uh, maybe not as spectacular as some of the great running backs, uh, you know, maybe not as flashy, uh, but yet when you look at the whole package, uh, you know, runner inside, outside, catching the football, blocking, knowing what to do, production, um, the fact that he plays 18 games a year, every year, uh, you know, that has tremendous value. You know, you look at why Calvin rushes every year for 1,000 yards, it's because he plays every game. Dependability, uh, you know, is uh, a tremendous asset. Uh, durability uh, is a tremendous asset. And, you know, the thing about Calvin, uh, like I said, he's a tough, tough individual. Probably doesn't get the credit that he deserves that way. Uh, but yet, uh, you know, the Calgary Stampeders were successful because guys like that uh, lined up each week and went out and did a job. I wanted to do something a little bit different to make the cowboy town the cowboy town, so I went and looked for a horse. I wanted to find a white horse, but I couldn't find one that I wanted. and. So I got a young lady named Twyla McLean to ride the horse down the middle of the field, carrying the flag during the national anthem. It's strange that you got some criticism for that <laughs> being what it was, but uh, it was still uh, a very good deal. And so she then in turn came to me afterwards and said, I get tired of waiting till the game's over to take the horse. Can I run down, the, take the horse down the sideline uh, after we score? And I said, yeah. And I said, maybe you'll hit come with a couple of the other team's players on the way down or back. But, I started the horse and she started racing down the sideline. That's the way it started and they still do it and I'm still proud of that. I think over a period of time, I broke my nose somewhere between six and seven times. Uh, it was just healing at one time and uh, what happened was I was in a ball game and. And in those days, remember, we didn't play with uh, masks uh, back when I started playing. And uh, so, of course, the first time I had a plastic mask, it was a little strip of plastic that came out in front of your nose. And so uh, the uh, player I was playing against felt that this was a handle and started pulling down on it and just spread my nose wider. And sooner or later, I ended up with a beak on it. So, I mean, it takes sometimes, you know, like it's... Uh, uh, in, in the sport itself, if you have to look at all the injuries that you're going to get, you, uh, you know, you'd fray away from the football aspect of it because the potential is there. But, you know, if you play for the love of the sport, you play for the love of the sport. Going to football games as a kid was uh, quite an experience. Uh, brought up in a, in a, a modest neighborhood, and uh, my friends, we probably could have afforded, if we would have worked at it, to pay to go into these games. But uh, a lot of times that wasn't the point. It was whether or not you can get in there for nothing. And we uh, finally came up, instead of going underneath the fences, over the fences, a lot of people were do, or just charge, and the security guards would manage to get maybe one or two of you, but three you'd get in. We devised a plan where we'd buy one ticket, and then one guy would go in, of course, and now have the stub. He'd stick it in a wallet and throw it over the fence to the next guy. And the next guy would walk in, show him the stub, said he was just out outside, and then we'd all get in. Did that every week or every game. My first year starting at guard, and we're playing in Calgary, and we're playing against, and I'm playing against John Helton. 
and John Helton, for some reason, switched over me. And that reason was because I was really bad and he was really good. So he was going to have a big day. And Ron Lancaster was our quarterback. And uh, probably about the second or third play of the game, uh, John Helton, like he beat me clean. I didn't even touch him. And I look back, and he's got a hold of Lancaster by the scruff of the neck and the britches of the pants, and he throws him about 10, 15 yards <laughs> down the field. And I could see the the blood come out of Ronnie's arm from the turf burns and all this stuff, and um, I'm in trouble. Like, he hit our man, Ron Lancaster, and he hit him pretty good. And I go back and huddle, and Ronnie looks at me, and I'm got, you know, got my eyes down because I'm like a whip pup, and he called me a lot of names, and none of them are Roger. It was very special to play with the Stampeders for 11 years. Unbelievable thing was that my brother Joe and my brother John played their entire careers with the Stampeders. And that's very unusual that you would have three players, professional players, that play that length of a time for one team, let alone being three brothers to do it for just one team. My mother would never watch a football play but she was the best person that would tell you exactly what would happen in the huddle. Because in the huddle she would watch, but as soon as they broke the huddle, she would get her rosary out and start praying until the play was over. She would never watch a football game. It was amazing. Always afraid that one of her sons would get hurt. She went through hell for, oh, about 17 years, I think. Believe me, my whole world was football. I really wasn't conscious about anything else. I was one of those athletes that was just an athlete. Yes, uh, I did go to university, I did get my degree, and when I came here I was a school teacher for a while, but that wasn't, um, that wasn't a priority to me. My number one thing was, uh, was football, and I really took it to heart. And winning and losing was very important. And I like to read about it in the paper also, whether we won or lost. And of course, if they said something about me, I'd read it twice. When I first walked in, and to be amongst the guys uh, Jerry Keeling, Larry Robinson, Peter Lisk, uh, Frank Andrewski, John Helton, all of these players that just a few years ago, out in the fields, I'm calling their name and I was pretending I was one of those guys. Unbelievable experience, unbelievable feeling. And uh, then you realize that these guys are just normal guys. You put them so far in a pedestal and so high up there emotionally that they get you going till you meet them and it brings you back down to reality but that also helps your play in football because you realize that these guys they don't criticize you and they only help you of which each and every one of them did probably the football player that helped me the most would be my brothers Joe and John um, obviously you look up to them because they're the siblings and it was such a great experience for me to catch up to them and play on the same teams. Whenever you have a problem, how fortunate is one when you can not only go to one of your teammates, but you can actually go to your brother, a family member. And uh, they definitely helped me through. Well, as far as the quarterbacks in Calgary, you know, I've always believed, you know, and I use the, I guess, the Montreal Canadiens of old as an example. The Montreal Canadiens of old, of all, when they had their great teams, always had what uh, I think the old timers we call as the black aces. You know, they had the great young players that uh, weren't allowed to play, uh, you know, till the hierarchy uh, felt that they were, you know, uh, a part of, of the tradition, a part of the history. And their skills had nothing to do with when it was time for them to play. I think it was more when they were emotionally and mentally ready to play. And, uh, you know, so that's something that I always, uh, you know, believed in. Uh, when we got to Calgary and I was given the opportunity, you know, I knew that the quarterback position was the most important position. And I knew that uh, you had to have a succession of people in place uh, so that if there was an injury or if somebody left, uh, that you would have the next person to step up. And, 
you know, taking the Canadians' example of the Black Aces uh, was always something that, uh, you know, was in the back of my mind. Uh, get the good young college players. Uh, don't allow them to play. You know, uh, make every opportunity for them to, you know, to learn, uh, to progress, and then when their chance was to play, that they were going to succeed. You can almost guarantee their success. As far as looking for a CFL quarterback, uh, you know, there's a lot of ingredients that are obvious. Uh, you know, one, you want him to have a quick, good quick release. You know, you want him to be athletic. Uh, you want him to, uh, you know, come from a passing a game or a passing school so that he has a good foundation uh, in all of those things. Uh, you know, and those are the obvious things. Uh, you know, the things that I've always uh, done behind the scenes is, you know, try to find out what kind of uh, a person he is, how intelligent he is, how well he takes the coaching, how well, you know, he can stick to the game plan, you know, what his disciplines are. You know, so often uh, a quarterback has to be disciplined, and, and discipline means that he's got to follow the game plan. Sometimes uh, quarterbacks don't want to take the easy road. They all want to take the hard road. And, uh, you know, so you try to find out in their background, you know, have they been uh, disciplined? Are they coachable? Can they take, uh, you know, the instructions and, you know, and do what you're asked. A lot of quarterbacks don't want to do what you ask them. They want to do what they think is the right thing to do, and, and that gets them in trouble. Mawada Stadium, which no one probably even remembers anymore, but that was the old stadium in Calgary, and I'll tell you, we used to play a few night games there, and I'll tell you, it was the darkest stadium I ever played in my life. When I came to Calgary, in 1958, you know, looking at the stadium uh, of, uh, you know, a pop where you probably had 13,000 fans could fit in there. And then the McMahon brothers decided that, hey, the stadium needed upgrading. If this is professionalism, then what they should do is they, they made a contribution because George uh, McMahon was uh, the president of the club and he, is, he and his brother were in the oil business. So they donated a a substantial amount of money to the university and to get the stadium started up uh, by the University of Calgary. And it ultimately got started in March of 1960 and it was completed in 101, 103 working days and I always remember what the general, the head of the general contractor said was, is the stadium be open for that first game against Winnipeg? And he said, well, the paint might not be dry. It was just that close to getting uh, the the stadium done, but it was a, that really what took our football club from uh, a mediocre type franchise into a, a, a major league franchise. The McMahon Stadium probably <clears throat> was one of the few stadiums at that time in North America that ever capitalized itself by paying for itself from the original investment. We are in a competitive business, and I think, uh, you know, I've always thought is, you know, are you afraid to lose or are you afraid to win? And, and I think, you know, the answer, I think, has to be you, ha you have to hate losing. Uh, you can get complacent when you win, but you always have to hate losing. I think the, the great motivation in sport is, is the, is the uh, hatred of losing. Losing, you know, there's nothing positive about it. There's nothing good about it. There's nothing that makes you feel like you want to do it again. Uh, you know, winning happens sometimes, and I've done this myself, and I think the players or coaches that have won a lot can get complacent about winning, and, and, and they don't appreciate winning like they should. But losing never becomes fun. Okay, as far as great cup rings, you know, I have filled this hand, right? And uh, the thing I'm coming to grips with is that you can never have enough. You know, I mean, the, the ring is something that uh, you obviously treasure and you value. But I think the accomplishment of winning a championship, you know, is what's really, really important. Uh, you know, whether you have a, a beautiful ring made by Intergold or, you know, a high school looking ring made by someone else 20 years ago, the sense that you were a champion that year has, you know, has tremendous, I think, emotional uh, value. And, uh, you know, being, like I said before, in this sport, uh, you know, the only thing that's, uh, I think, makes all of what we do worthwhile is, is been able to win a championship.
Since 1945, the Calgary Stampeders have experienced the euphoria of capturing the Grey Cup five times. In 1948, the 12-0 Calgary Stampeders emerged from the West to challenge for the Grey Cup against the Ottawa Rough Riders. Along with the Stampeders came their fans, who injected a little Western hospitality to the Grey Cup festivities that remain to this day. Keith Spaeth was the commander of the Stampeder offense that would produce two touchdowns. Also leading the way for Calgary, was Chuck Anderson, whose timely blocks and tackles were vital to their success. The final result was a 12-7 triumph and the first Grey Cup championship for the Calgary Stampeders. Following Grey Cup losses in 1949, 68, and 70, the Calgary Stampeders were back in 1971 to face the Eastern champion Toronto Argonauts at Vancouver's Empire Stadium. The Stampeder defense would take control of the soggy gridiron. In the twilight of his storied career, linebacker Wayne Harris played inspiring football. Harris tackled the Argonaut ball carriers with ferocity. The Stampeder offense was generated by quarterback Jerry Keeling. In the first quarter, he completed a pass to Herm Harrison for the first Calgary touchdown of the game. In the second quarter, Jesse Mims recorded Calgary's second major score on a six-yard run. The Calgary Stampeders would take a 14-3 lead into the half. In the third quarter, Toronto rallied as offensive guard Roger Scales rumbled 38 yards for a touchdown to make the score Calgary 14, Toronto 11. With just over three minutes remaining in the fourth quarter, Toronto's Dick Thornton intercepted a Jerry Keeling pass and gave the Argonauts a legitimate chance to win the game. But on the second down of Toronto's possession, disaster struck. Argonaut running back Leon McQuay took a handoff from Joe Theismann. McQuay cut to the middle and his feet gave way on the slick turf. Calgary recovered the fumble and went on to a 14-11 Grey Cup victory. It was their first national championship since 1948 and a chance for superstar Wayne Harris to hoist the most coveted prize in Canadian football. Following a Grey Cup defeat to the powerful Toronto Argonauts in 1991, the Calgary Stampeders were back in 1992 to face the Winnipeg Blue Bombers at the Sky Dome in Toronto. It was the Grey Cup debut for Stampeder quarterback Doug Flutie, and he would put on a show. Flutie's passing and scrambling abilities confused the blitzing bomber defense. One of his favorite targets that afternoon was all-Canadian Dave Sapunjas, who stampeded into the end zone for a touchdown. Flutie also utilized star receiver Alan Pitts, who would also make a trip to the end zone. On the defensive side of the ball, Calgary smothered quarterback Matt Dunnigan and the Winnipeg offense. It was total domination for Wally Buono Stampeders as they celebrated a 24-10 Grey Cup victory over the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. Following disappointment in the 1995 Grey Cup and a series of losses in various Western finals, the Stampeders were back on the national stage in 1998. At Winnipeg Stadium, they faced the Hamilton Tiger Cats for supremacy in Canadian football. The Calgary offense was fueled by Jeff Garcia, who would pass for 260 yards and score a rushing touchdown. In addition to Garcia's heroics, Stampeder running back Kelvin Anderson rushed for 105 yards. Ultimately, the game would be decided by one man. For Stampeder kicker Mark McLaughlin, emotions were running high. With no time left on the clock, McLaughlin was called upon to kick the Stampeders to victory. In addition to deciding the outcome of the game, a recent death of McLaughlin's father weighed heavily on his mind. But he remained focused and delivered a heavenly kick through the uprights for a 26-24 Grey Cup victory.
The Calgary Stampeders met the Winnipeg Blue Bombers in the 2001 Grey Cup at Montreal's Olympic Stadium. The 8 and 10 Stampeders entered the championship game an underdog. Despite a below 500 record during the regular season, they would rise to the occasion in the biggest game of the year. Marcus Crandall navigated the Stampeder offense. Crandall's first big play of the game was in the second quarter when he launched a 68-yard touchdown bomb to Mark Richter. The Stampeders struck again just moments later when Crandall hit Travis Moore with a touchdown pass. Crandall's strong performance earned him game MVP honors. The Stampeders were riding high as they took a 17-4 lead into the half. The pivotal moment of the game occurred in the fourth quarter when Aldi Henry blocked a Bob Cameron punt which allowed Willie Fells to rumble into the end zone for the game-winning points. The final result was a 27-19 Grey Cup triumph for the Calgary Stampeders. The Calgary Stampeders continue their quest for glory as future generations strive to become Grey Cup champions. Canadian football is a magic show. It is a game that has grabbed our nation by the heart. This is the story of CFL Traditions, a five-hour television special that showcases the history and heroes of Canadian football. Live the game's greatest moments through the eyes and hearts of its most celebrated legends. Now available on DVD and VHS, CFL Traditions is the ultimate collector's edition. Each of the nine franchises is featured in their own special team edition release. Nine teams, nine titles, available in stores everywhere. football it is is something I was brought up on. I love the game because it's quick. It, it has always allowed the quarterback to be able to run with the ball and I thoroughly enjoyed that challenge. In the Canadian League, uh, no such thing as being a rookie. You, you, you're a contributor or you're not or else you don't make it. The excitement in the game in a Canadian football game with the three downs, with the wider field, with the kick return, it may be the best game in the world to watch on television. It's so fast, it's so wide open, and it, I, I think it, it speaks to my personality. It's sort of a living on the edge type of football game. It's exciting. You're never out of a ball game in the Canadian Football League. And as a quarterback, that's all you want is a chance. You want to have the ball in your hands with one minute to play and give your team a chance to win the ball game. It was an opportunity that I was being given that I didn't see happening in my own country. And I really weighed the pros and cons of going to Canada or staying in the United States. And I chose to go to Canada because they were giving me a realistic opportunity to play the game that I love. I came up just with the attitude that I was going to learn about the CFL put my best foot forward. Whatever it took, I was going to get the job done, and anything else was not acceptable. I wanted to come play, and in the NFL, they would have just used me for, you know, okay for this and for that. And in Edmonton, I knew I had a chance to do what I wanted to do and play the game. It put the fun back in football for me. It enabled me to go back out, just be an athlete, play football, and enjoy it. And 
I'll be forever grateful for that. The Canadian Football League is arguably the most significant cultural institution in the country as it relates to bringing cities across the country together. It's the one thing, the one professional sport that we have left that we can say is purely Canadian. It's the only one.